This is Backdoor Boink, where we welcome every side of everyone. Please note, this is an 18 plus podcast. It's time to put in some earbuds if you don't want to answer awkward questions from your children, family, or friends. I'm Kayla, a certified relationship and intimacy coach. And I'm MJ, and I brought the lube. In this podcast, we explore the behind the scenes of a weekly wellness topic. Our goal is to help you feel good, be naughty. Thank you for checking out our After Dark, After Hours podcast. You can find more information, including our YouTube channel, social media accounts, events, Discord, and products at boinked.com. That's www.boink-ed.com. Now, let's get in that back door. Yay! I did it. We did it. We're we're rolling. We got this. Got this. So (laughs) we're doing our third uh, guest interview, guest speaker. And today we have Riven. So lucky number three. Oh, excellent. I love it. I like three. <laughs> well, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. I know uh, scheduling was kind of a pain in the ass. So yes. <laughs> is, is today your actual birthday? No, actual birthday was on last Saturday while I was at Tethered. Oh, damn. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Check it out. Check it out. What I'm wearing today. What does it say? It's my birthday. Sign my shirt. And it's right across the bazooms. <laughs> but there are no signatures. Well, there's a couple. I did wear it at Tethered, but everyone was very much like, I don't want to touch you, which is great because, but everybody was, you know, hello and happy birthday from a distance, which was really the point. <laughs> I'm jealous enough that you went to Tethered, but the fact that that's how you got to celebrate your birthday. So oh, my good. gosh. <laughs> all right. So we'll have to do a different episode all about your experiences at Tethered together. Yes, absolutely. All right. For today, we are going to focus on pro-dom. Yes. Love it. And Love it. This is something that I understand you used to do, but before we dive in, because I've made a few missteps in talking to pro doms before. Are there any specific special terms that we need to know before we go in? Hmm. Um, That's a great question. It's hard to give specifics uh, when I don't know what your knowledge base is. So I always feel like I talk down at people because I'm never really sure like what their knowledge level is. Um, But um, I feel like the common one that people might get a little um, stiff about is the, (laughs) I saw that. She said Um, stiff. (laughs) (laughs) um, Is that the term sex worker as it Mm. relates to pro-dom work. Um, And the term applies in the loosest of sentences because it is a, a branch of sex work, even if... Um, for myself and, and actually the majority of the pro doms that I also know and work with, um, there was no sexual contact at all. However, because we are working within the world of, of kinks, which has become explicitly sexualized, even though there's a lot of kinks that have nothing to do with people's sexual desires, Absolutely. Um, we still get lumped into that category of a sex worker and there are um pro doms that will have a physical relationship as it relates to the work that they're doing with somebody um i think that there's a uh, not like a moralistic demarcation uh but i do think that uh sometimes people will get confused about exactly what pro dom means um and that they think that it is explicitly a sexual role, uh, much the same way like there's the uh, terms for other types of sex workers. It just immediately becomes some sort of a a, uh, sexual connotation. Okay. That is a very good distinction and a very clear outlook on why it is that you get lumped or that pro-doms get lumped into that category. Um, My missteps have come with talking about how pro-doms are compensated for their time and service. 
and referring to the people that they work with. So I Mm. understand that you are not air quotes paid as you so much uh, receive tribute. Yes, yes. Tribute is the preferred uh, nomenclature for that um, as a lot of the structure for prodoming uh, as it relates to the individuals that we are uh, working with is about a uh, this hierarchical sort of a sensation um, and the quote-unquote clientele or the subs uh, part of their experience is they don't want to feel like a John Doe there is supposed to be a level of intimacy there because we are working with people's a slightly deeper, darker desire than strictly sex. You know, we're diving into a lot of psychology and there's a lot of vulnerability on both ends for pro-dom work that when we start using things like, you know, the, the terminology becomes important because how you say things is important, you know, so we don't talk about getting paid and things like that. It's a tribute because the way you're thinking about this interaction changes. And that's really important for the relationship that gets built between a, a, a dom and their sub. That is awesome. I thought it was purely legal maneuverings, but both both, both is good. <laughs> Why not both? Why um, not both? But that is very, very true. There's a psychology that comes into play with any BDSM and kink Mm -hmm. uh, and making sure that you're touching on all aspects of that exchange and that relationship and still feeding into that psychology. That's Mm -hmm. awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and it's a good point. Uh, Depending on where an individual lives, there are legalities to um, the structure that is allowed around such things. Um, And in you know, there are some states that it's it's scary. Regardless of if there is any sort of monetary exchange, it's scary to participate in kink in any way because of the legalities around it. I mean, there's there's some states that you can even consent to bodily harm uh, if it's in the context of, of a sexual exploit. You know, you can go boxing, you can be in the SCA, you can get the absolute crap kicked out of you in an MMA fight, but God forbid you enjoy it too much. And now <laughs> it's illegal. <laughs> That so. is the comparison that I do have people keep coming back to. We are, uh, MJ and I, we're Massachusetts residents. And so we do talk a lot with our clientele about how Massachusetts state, without even a complaint in the state, can go ahead and press charges on, on behalf of the, yes, exactly. Yep, exactly. Stuff like that is scary. Yes, or... there there are a lot of organizations that are are cropping up that will help. Um, but until we see some, and and I understand that they're trying to protect the people that need it. Absolutely. Um, so it's it's a balancing act. It's still in the works. <laughs> right. There's the the core reasons for a lot of those, like you said, that they're they're pro- trying to protect individuals who are clearly a victim of domestic abuse. Mm-hmm. And there are situations that they won't press charges because, and there's a whole psychology behind the victim mentality. And that is why they got some of these laws in there, but it is definitely being used in a way that doesn't further that goal. They're walking into parties with a bunch of consenting adults where it's like, this is what this is, we're supposed to be doing here. And they're still trying to enforce some sort of morality uh, on their culture by, by a using these laws that were supposed to be protecting people. And now all they're doing is imposing one person's morality onto somebody else. Absolutely. All right. I have I have more questions, but I yes. feel like I, oh, MJ's given me the, he's good. You're good. You're still looking up ly- uh, limericks over there, aren't you? I haven't had time. Okay. All right. So he's going to take his back seat and, <laughs> uh, <laughs> and find his limericks. So let's rewind to your beginning. How Sure. Did you get into pro dom work? And once you decided that it's something you wanted to be in, what steps did you take to get started? Whew. Rewind. Uh, so let's let's scroll back about. Oh, how old am I? It's my birthday. I got to figure that out now. Um, Twenty five. <laughs> oh, I like you. I like him. Uh, so, gosh, I would say about 
almost 20 years ago. Um, it starts with my very first relationship. You know how you're kind of still figuring things out. And you're like, oh, this is how relationships work. And then you have a second one. You're like, oh, this is how relationships work. And you always think you got it figured out. Uh, and then you never do. But that's besides the point. I had a partner that was incredibly exploratory as my very first experience with partnerships. So I just thought that this is was just part of what you do. So for, for a very long time, I was with this person um, pretty consistently for almost 10 years. And at the time, we were monogamous. So I just thought that the things that we were exploring and doing and being like, hey, this seems like a cool, fun thing was just kind of an extension of relationships and what you do. And then I had a second relationship and they're like, what the actual, like, what? <laughs> what is what you do what now you want to try what what do you mean you've done this before um so i was really fortunate to have a partner early on that was very open to exploration that's just how i was able to start and i started late like i was in college uh before i had a sexual relationship um so I was able to even approach it more uh, from the understanding of a slightly more adult uh, view, uh, more access to information, things like that. So uh, I was very fortunate in that aspect. Uh, and then as my relationships progressed, uh, one of the more serious relationships that I got into, um, they were very, very heavily steeped in the actual community. Because up until that point, this was just something personal that I was doing in between just my partner and I. Um, and then I stepped into the poly community and this next relationship that I had that was like a serious long-term relationship was very heavily steeped in the, in the kink community. So we started attending conventions, we started exploring the more structured portions of what kink dynamics looked like versus just exploring the sensations of it. So that relationship got me into contact with a lot of individuals that had really good information, you know, educators and things like that. During that portion of my life, I also started making kink implements. So we became even deeper set into the kink community. It was at that point, like, I became more well-known, and the individuals that set up the parties, the, the people who are finding subs and then connecting them to their dom that would make sense for them, said, hey, you know, is this something you would be interested in doing? Um, you know, what are your thoughts on these sorts of things? So my, my fall into this was a lot of open exposure to the community and becoming known somebody that was trusted well enough to be um, a part of the actual structured pro-dom work. So I was doing a lot of like fetish parties and things like that as, as like a service top and things. And depending on which state I was working at the time, depended on what type of, of activities we were allowed to, to do. Well, it just seems to have evolved naturally for you then. It did. It was a very natural, um, over many years, progression of gathering knowledge, gathering skills was the other important thing. Uh, there is there is a skill to how to interact with people. Um, you know, anyone who's done any sort of customer service job or jobs that require any sort of common tell will tell you that it is just being able to interact with people without strangling them because they don't want it <laughs> is a skill set. Um, interacting people and then strangle them because they want it. Now you're a pro dom. <laughs> Why are you looking at me like that? You're looking away, <laughs> trying not to, you know, comment on this desire to strangle. <laughs> I volunteer uh, so as tribute. <laughs> me, please, me. <laughs> All right, my next question that I had. How are you feeling? Are you like under the microscope here? No, no, not at all. I'm <laughs> public speaking is one of the things that I'm kind of okay at. So I'm comfortable. I'm glad <laughs> you are. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> all right. This one I feel is something that everybody is going to ask, at least in some variety. And mm. you can obviously say, hey, we're not going there. But I'm curious to know, what is the most 
memorable request or scene that you had in your pro dom days? Oh, look at the smirk. The relationships that get built over pro doming uh, depend a lot on the exposure. Um, I had a lot of people that was just party based. The client is the client. The sub isn't yours specifically it's there it's like a contract through whatever party you're working and things like that so some of the parties we didn't have the depth that allowed the more interesting requests but as a dom that just had lifestyle subs outside of the like the pro dom world there's been some interesting requests in that aspect um I think from like a pro the pro dom side of it, the more interesting requests were kind of mild. Like one of them wanted to like scrape the toenail polish off of my toes with his teeth. Um, which wow, is is a mild request, but one of the like that's gonna taste funny, my dude. But you go for it, you go for it. You know? <laughs> no, I will get another pedicure. It's fine. Uh, um, wow. Yes, um, I think. Uh, some of the, another more uh, interesting one I had was they, they wanted to take pictures of me doing mm -hmm. pro dummy stuff, you know, wearing something, you know, like a latex cat suit or something and being like, yes, look at me. I'm raw. Uh, but they wanted to be naked. So that, that is a request that gets, um, there, and there's a term for it too. It's a, it's an acronym that don't ask me to say it right now because I will get it wrong but there is already a, like a closed closed female nude male uh, or is it the other way around I, I'm bad with nouns I'm sorry uh, so I've gotten those C F N M. there we go yeah thank closed you female naked closed male. female naked male there we go um, so I get those ones. Yeah. Um, there, there was some requests for um, like a, they wanted a consensual peeping Tom fantasy. Like um, enough. It wasn't even like, I want to watch you doing something sexual with somebody else while I watch you pretend like I, you don't know I'm there, but even just like watch you reading in like your nighty or something and kind of like or or a, in a bathtub even if they can't see that you're naked they like just the fact that you're in the bathtub and you like you don't know they're there like there, there's a lot of of uh, they don't want to be actually violating somebody's consent but that's the fantasy of watching somebody who doesn't know they're being watched so that was those were the ones and the really extreme physical sensation ones were never the ones that surprised me. I, I guess I shouldn't say a lot of them surprised me, but um, it was the ones that were always very deeply seated in some sort of psychological something that they were working through. And it was, and you could always tell they were very hyper-specific. And despite the fact that in the grand scheme of BDSM, it was very mild, they were still really nervous about sharing that. So those were the ones that always stuck with me because this like, I'm really seeing a, a slice of the psychological profile of this person because a lot of people are like, yeah, beat me till I bleed and I'm okay with that. And it's like, <laughs> Great, let's do it. I have I have beat somebody black and blue and, you know, I have had to retire floggers because it's really hard to get blood out of the flogger tails, you know, like, and mm. it's like, cool, do the thing. And then there's people that are like, this means a lot to me, you know, here have a little piece of my soul. Um, and those are the ones, I, ironically, that always stuck out to me as being like the the more interesting requests. Absolutely. That takes it to a depth of the exchange that you mm -hmm. mentioned, psychological. There is definitely a special service that's being offered here regardless of how deep down the sex worker category we're going um and a lot of times it could be just as simple as giving people acceptance even if it is just the you know beat me till i'm black and right. blue kind of thing like Yes, you're accepted here. This is accepted as a valid kink, a valid desire. Um, but then, yeah, getting into those specifics deeper down the psychological uh, trail. Yeah. Oh, and I'm realizing the the one of the things I had mentioned about um, like watching somebody 
Mm. It's like, okay, there, there, there was a, the end to that being that they get caught um, and then Ooh. they're punished. <laughs> I had, that was like that's an important bit to add to that but yeah they wanted to like watch and then you know get caught and punished um wrestling also was another one they they all really want to just get the crap key kicked out of them via wrestling and just be dominated like they're literally physically just you know throw me to the ground or me throw them to the ground so you're strong is what you're saying too <laughs> there's yeah, there is. There was a point where uh, I could sit in like a just on my butt without my feet or anything leaning. So I'm just sitting in a V for like an hour at a time, like just doing things. It, it, it was a core strength is what I'm saying is. is oh, yeah. OK, OK. Uh, the behind the scenes of what it really takes uh, to dominate. So tired. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so you, you mentioned that a lot of. Um, the work that you did was in a, a party style setting. Mm -hmm. um, what steps did you take other than, you know, the party, I imagine, is vetted. All of these people have gone through questions um, to make sure that they're safe members of the community. Um, mm -hmm. But otherwise, what kind of steps did you take to remain safe? Safety is a, a number one for me personally. And I'm it's for a lot of people as well. I Safety is the thing that motivates a lot of what I do. Um, and I had to take a lot of the precautions of like, you know, you never like in a party setting, it's slightly easier. Like you never go into a room that has a lockable door. You never um, really what for as far as me, I'd, I would never even go outside of, of eye shot of another pro dom and we always had those discussions of like safe words things like that because if a obviously if your sub calls a safe word you know there's there's very clear expectations to that but if there's a situation that the dom requires assistance for some reason what does that look like so you know you I had a buddy system, or I should say I had a buddy system. If I was working with somebody, I had at least one other person there, usually more than that, um, because you, you tend to get to know your, your fellow pro doms. Because um, sometimes you'll do like co-topping stuff, you know, so you, you try to build a relationship with them. And you, you had your own safe words for if you required assistance, um, because in a kink setting and a BDSM setting, sometimes yelling really loudly doesn't trip up something is wrong sensors, you know, sometimes it's <laughs> what's supposed to be happening is this screaming. So <laughs> you had to do the same thing as a top to just have those systems in place that you know that this specific scenario means something has gone wrong. And in the instances where someone wants to become a, a personal sub versus just in a party setting, you you vet them. Um, same way I think a lot of women um, would vet potential partners the first time that they're meeting them. Uh, you know, you check their socials. You Have you had another dom before that I can talk to? You know, you, you have a conversation with them in a public place first. Like there's, there's a lot of safety aspects to it that um, there's a lot of crossover for physical safety. And then as far as like mental, emotional safety, like you have to have a lot of awareness of yourself and enough base knowledge of psychology or how people work to recognize when something is off with your sub as well. Like, are they feeling safe? Even if they're saying something like, do you need to do a check-in right now? Do you need to do a check-in with yourself? Like, where's your, your, your emotional mental safety right now? Like, do you have the spoons to be doing this? So there's, there's a lot of layers of um, a lot of things that you can do to be safe. Ooh, I need those. Give them. Give me, give me. There's spoons <laughs> and then there's fucks. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. These are my fucks to give. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Um, sorry, I know it's a podcast, so people aren't going to be able to see us despite uh, this <laughs> lovely exchange. So we have a mason jar that usually remains uh, empty and it's labeled fucks. And then we have a collection of spoons uh, because there is a difference. Yes. I can have all the fucks in the world, but no spoons to get anything done. So 
Exactly. <laughs> um, but we digress. It, making sure that you have the spoons for you and for another person. Um, mm-hmm. And I imagine that there's some sort of, of separation, like a conscious and a subconscious um, effort being made during these scenes uh, because you're kind of divided into the atmosphere you're trying to create and then the logical keeping an eye on on everything, being mm-hmm. in two two worlds at once. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, the, um, the energy that is required is different from person to person. Um, like for myself, part of the reason why I don't do it professionally anymore is because I had to give more spoons than I could get back from the experience on a professional level. Um, The connection was really important for me. And unfortunately, the arenas that I had available to me to be doing this didn't offer back enough to sustain it, which was the like mental, emotional safety portion of it. So while I never felt unsafe Um, in the sense of like, I thought I was going to be harmed by someone else. I knew that continuing to be performative in my BDSM world was going to give me burnout for the scene. So, you know, that is maintaining that is is super important uh, because otherwise you're going to lose the desire to be in the world at all. I feel like I've circumvented the question a little bit, though. No, actually, that's perfect, because my next question was was going to be, why did you stop? And it makes sense, even on the most vanilla terms, if you make your art your work, if you make mm-hmm. your hobbies and your passion your work. Some people like to say you'll never work a day in your mm-hmm. life, but on the other hand, it can take that passion and that love out of it. Um, mm-hmm. And it's not fulfilling in the same way that it once was. So recognizing that for yourself, absolutely huge. So you're not doing it professionally, but do you remain active in BDSM either personally or in the community? Yes, absolutely. I am still very active. Uh, as, as we mentioned earlier, I went to Tethered for my birthday, which is a amazing rope centric convention. Um, there are other, you know, they have dungeons that allow uh, all uh, most other types of play. I shouldn't say all. There were signs up that about very specific things that because of the state that they the convention is held in, you're not allowed to do X, Y, Z. Oh, I'm curious, what's on the no-no list? The no-no list was odd from my opinion uh, <laughs> no breath play okay so no choking and nothing that pierces the skin oh so coming coming from your perspective knowing some of the stuff that you do <laughs> you're like wait no no really? piercing no no needles <laughs> <laughs> no needles no knives no no, no instrument that can <laughs> pierce the skin um which if there were like, okay, no bodily fluids, I would be like, okay, yes, that is. That makes but sense. But you were allowed to have sex in the dungeon. Interesting. So there's, so, I mean, any worry about transmitted stuff is is still applicable even without blood. So, mm. right. So it, but it was, it was specifically nothing that was going to spill blood or make you pass out intentionally. I wonder if some of the organizers had my phobia. I'm what I'm just wondering if that might have played a, a role. Oh. Skyla and Ozma were awesome. I had a had a incidental ability to briefly interact with them as two women who got together and uh, were like, "Hey, the scene doesn't have this thing that we need. Let's build something." Um, so fantastic. I'm. Uh, Trying, I'm getting into contact with them actually to try to pick their brains a little bit because of Sporf, but uh, but we're gonna have a whole separate uh, uh, podcast hopefully about Tethered specifically. It's very yes. fascinating. Um, so we'll I'll set that aside. Okay. Uh, so yes. Uh, so for my birthday, I went to a kink convention. So that was great. Um, I organized and 
um, put together a kink party every four to six weeks, depending on what the availability of the venue is. And that is something that I put a lot into. I've gone to several other conventions, even since not doing pro dom work anymore. Uh, I have partners that I explore uh, interpersonal BDSM stuff with in a lot of different forms. Uh, so it's stepping back from the professional side of it gave me more room and spoons to enjoy the connections that are allowed to be built when you're exploring something at such a intimacy with somebody that you trust. And not, not all the partners even have to be sexual. I have a um, I, I have a, a meme that I made that I was rather amused with um, that was like, bottom with trust issues and, and skills? No, service top. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, you know, a lot of the skills that I have and have collected incidentally over 20 years um, are skills that people want or would enjoy. And mm -hmm. I'm happy to have those sorts of uh, connections with people. So I'm able to do a lot of service top stuff, even if there's no emotional mental dynamic of me being like, yeah, get on your knees portion of like the, the doming, but people still want things like being tied up, but they still need to feel safe with the person that's tying them. Um, you know, needle play is, can be dangerous. So there's needs to be <laughs> safety in the top of their knowledge and things like that and it's still you know a level of, of intimacy there um electro play like there's all these things that um their sensation play that still require an enormous amount of trust but they don't require a uh, a, a dynamic exchange um and i don't know what the knowledge base of your listening crew is but uh, when i say a, a dynamic i mean um, the the dominant submissive portion of it, it's more of a, um, you know, top bottom. There's no um, power. Yeah, there's no exchange. power exchange. Yeah, right. So it's it's more it. about an experience as far as the, the physical sensations. Yeah, and it's more of a giver receiver than yeah. a top bottom or a dominant right. submissive. Yeah, I like that. Giver receiver. That's so. a good way to, to divvy that up. Okay. MJ. You gotta have at least one question. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm gonna stop inviting you to the interview once. I told you to go ahead and do it. Oh my gosh. You don't let me talk any other time. I gave you the list. You could have asked any one of those <clears throat> questions. I have yet to get to it. Oh. <laughs> it's not my fault. I gave you an outline this time and you didn't read it. Okay. Um, well, one of the questions I had, and I'm not sure if you already answered it, um, by talking about the, the sex work category, uh, mm -hmm. was what is one thing you wish people anywhere knew about pro dom work? Yeah, I think that um, there's a lot of misconception about the type of people who would do pro dom work. I think that a lot of people hear pro dom and they immediately think of this uber bitch with black latex and I don't fucking care about you attitude. Oh, I didn't ask if there, I didn't ask about swearing on your channel. Oh no, you're fine. Not. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so they see this, you know, they think this like super bitch with her high heels and you know I'm gonna crush your balls underneath my my stiletto sort of a person. Um, and that is its own category. It's just not the only category. Um, some of the pro doms or even just lifestyle doms that I know, um, male, female, man, woman, agendered, like across the board, just the dom category are still some of the most like helpful, sweet, very super caring people and their propensity towards dominance is not about necessarily a disinterest in the well-being of their person. In fact, I feel like a lot of these individuals take it, the the well-being of the person more seriously than a lot of peer-to-peer -peer relationships happen. So I think a lot of people should take some time to understand 
that pro-dom or even not professionally, even if it's just in a relationship, in a uh, a person-to-person relationship, um, is not about a disinterest or a discarding of a submissive. It's a different category of a way to interact with somebody that doesn't necessarily mean mean or bad. Holy shit. I mean, as far as swearing. Uh, Holy shit. (laughs) Uh, I'm watching MJ nod through this whole thing, and that has to be one of the best definitions of a a dom that I have heard of in a long time. And coming from a a bottom or a submissive uh, perspective, I mean, not submissive, brat, I'm going to be honest. (laughs) Um, It's very different things. (laughs) Um, Brat, just brat. Yeah. Um, where was I going with this? Woo. Uh, it, it has always been a struggle. I, you know, I'm in a relationship with a switch. So there's always that desire in me to try and, and do the thing for him. But I'm like, I can't just be mean for the sake of being mean. And I can't just mm. err for the sake of being mm-hmm. err. So mm-hmm. scratch my back. It's, well, there's a difference between scratching and scratching. Um, but what you're talking about is how domination uh, actually comes from a space of caring. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I want to do these things for him. And instead of, you know, thinking about it in terms of trying to be mean and, and overpowering and discarding of his feelings or his physical well-being, this is an act of care i'm trying to give you an experience that you're seeking Mm -hmm. so i i absolutely love that and maybe it'll help me step into that a bit more and we'll see no (laughs) i always say despite having the desire to be a top or a dom uh, one of my hard lines for me as a top of things I'm like not going to do is degradation. Won't do it. Really? Really. Like had had requests for it, offered a lot of money, like a lot of money. And I'm like, no, <laughs> nope. Uh, it's my, my desire for doming or to be a top. I want to leave them better off than I found them. And I have yet to come across an experience that demanded degradation that i thought would leave them in a better place that's really sweet look at okay you're getting all getting all emotional now i don't mm, i don't know i don't know (laughs) which is is odd right someone was like i want to be beat within an inch of my life and i was like cool i can see why this would work for you and here's what we're going to do to make sure that everything is good afterwards uh but like tell me i'm got a small wee wee and I'm like no nah, man there's some things there you need to work on <laughs> like and again I'm this is zero percent king shaming uh that is just generally the the request that gets made most when somebody wants degradation it's more the concept that degradation as a whole um I don't find it shameful it is I feel like that is one of those things that should be um there are other ways to work through that that I and I don't think that this context is a way that leaves you better when you're done. So, and that's my opinion. And I am sure that somebody out there is going to have a different opinion as a way to like live through degradation in a safe manner. Um, Cause that's a lot of people work through um, traumatic experiences using kink because they can exposure therapy th- themselves mm-hmm. into being able to get over something that's happened. Um, so I, I acknowledge that I'm sure someone thinks that that is the best way for them to get through whatever they're working through. The situations that have come to me personally have not, has not uh, seemed that I would be leaving them in a better place than I found them, which is, that is, that is my line as a, a top. And it's important to have boundaries as a, as a top, as a bottom, as anybody involved in BDSM. So mm-hmm. All right. Well, that exhausts my questions that I had for you. Is there anything that you wanted to ask either of us, or is there anything you wanted to just throw into the podcast for shits and hahas? Let's see. Asking you, um, what what has your experience been with? Uh, what has your experience been? Um, has it butted up against 
uh, the pro-dom world in any way. My experience with pro-dom has actually only been in being in the same circles. So meeting you, for example, or there's another lovely lady at a rope event that I go to regularly who is an active pro-dom. Yeah, yeah. I, I, yep. You know. Um, oh my gosh, this pro dom in question. So we were at a rope event and <laughs> we were at the rope event and a comment was made by the host of the rope event that said, no bodily fluids below the waist. And she chimed in and went, so is spitting okay? And without missing a beat, I slid my ass across the floor, slid up next to her and went, hello. <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, yes. Amazing. So that's how that conversation started. That's exactly how that conversation started. And then, you know, there's some behind the scenes talking with MJ. And, eh, okay. So far, it hasn't it hasn't happened. But um, so, yeah, that's that has been the, the limit of my experience. I have had um, at least one client who has asked me, you know, how does one get into that? Um but that's as far as it's gone. Fascinating. What about you, MJ? What about me? You have a pro dom experience. What do you think I do all day? <laughs> oh wait, I heard cattle. <laughs> I heard cats. You heard cattle. Same there difference. you go. <laughs> all right. Well then, we good? I guess. Okay. Let's uh, have MJ do a naughty limerick, and I'll. I don't want to. You never want to. No. This is me. Uh, I thought you were the brat. Right. Well, he loves the phrase, doms are just brats with power. <laughs> oh, I love it. He embodies that. Mm-mm. I had a good teacher. <laughs> <laughs> a woman named Agatha Prim is exceedingly ugly and grim, but she still gets her joys in the absence of boys with all the toys she employs in her quim. Oh, ho, 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 ho. I mean, smart woman. I don't know many penises that can do even a third of the things that a, that the toys can do nowadays. So, you know what? They can barely vibrate. <laughs> really slow vibrate. It's very slow. <laughs> like something missing the batteries or something. Or... more power. Oh, like it's just starting to die and you're like, God. <laughs> All right. Well, Riven, thank you so very, very much for doing this, especially with all the plans that you have. Thank you again. This is this is awesome. I won't take up any more of your time. You've got parties to plan, v- vanilla or otherwise. All right. Yes. Um, <laughs> so thank you. And uh, I'll do my little my little wrap up. Thank you, everybody, for for listening. I hope you enjoyed this as much as I have. This is amazing. Absolutely. And, uh, we will be back next week. Maybe just MJ and I. Maybe we'll have another episode here sometime with Riven. Ooh, yeah. Love that. <laughs> but in the meantime, stay you, stay beautiful, feel good, be naughty. Good night. She said um. stiff. <laughs> Thanks again for listening to this podcast. I started Boink in 2022 with the goal to create a safe environment and culture for all genders and sexual orientations, to learn about and embrace every part of themselves and one another. We offer workshops, events, and various inclusive products, along with consultations to make sure we take a holistic approach to enhancing individuals' sexual satisfaction with themselves or their partners. I believe that when you accept yourself and your partner on the most intimate of levels, it filters out into your daily life. The World Health Organization recognizes this, saying sexual health is fundamental to the overall health and well-being of individuals, couples, and families, and to the social and economic development of communities and countries. So as long as you'll have us, Boink will be here. Kink-affirming, gender-blurring, sex-fulfilling. And you can find any of our details at www.boink-ed.com.